about an atheist film. And for once, I'm not just imagining that it's one. No, it technically is supposed to be one. In the mid to late 90s, Philip Pullman wrote a series of books called The Golden Compass. Because Pullman was a true blue atheist, he went on record saying he wanted these to be the atheistic counterpart of the Chronicles of Narnia, which he dubbed Christian propaganda corrupting the youth. So he basically made these books to offend Christian readers. Without even reading a single page of one of these books, I'll have you know you did a very good job offending me, good sir. Apparently, these books were well received and sold a bunch of copies, but that doesn't really surprise me. The Harold Potter books did well, and they had movies and a bunch of merchandise, because the media just loves glorifying occultic imagery and selling the evils of witchcraft and voodoo to children. This brings us to New Line Cinema, who are the same studio who made L Lord of the Rings. Oh, come on, I actually like the Lord of the Rings movies. <laughs> Why would you stoop to such a low like this, New Line Cinema? Why? Yeah, well, I I'm still not sold on this movie, especially knowing the fact it's meant to offend people like me. Either way, I guess we're just gonna have to watch this film for ourselves and see what kind of horrible, heathenistic garbage this film has to offer. Because after all, no one really likes to see people talk about things they like here on the web zone. This is The Golden Compass. We begin with an opening narration explaining every little detail of this world instead of just showing us. It's almost like they were trying to put a lot into just one movie or something. There are many universes and many Earths parallel to each other. So everyone in this movie's universe has a talking animal sidekick, or a demon as they're called, uh, their words not mine, who are also called souls. Apparently their human counterparts are linked to them spiritually. So not only was this film written by an atheist, but now we actually have demons and we're promoting actual satanic imagery. Well, good job, New Line Cinema. I hope you're proud of yourselves. They also explain this world is now under the tyrannical rule of the Magisterium, intended to be an Al Gore for the Catholic Church. And no, that was intentional. The writer said so and everything. For once, I'm not just looking too deep into a movie made for babies. In the next scene, we meet our main character, Lyra, who is intended to be mean and unlikable. Apparently this was intentional, as Pullman has gone on record saying that he didn't want to be accused of Moses and having the character be a Moser. So what he decided to do was to have her be unlikable from the get-go so that we see a character growth all throughout the film. Now it's here where I have to ask, just three minutes into the film, who is this movie made for? We have a child main character, so you'd think it'd be aimed more for children, but it's a PG-13, so it seems that they're trying to go for a little more of an older audience with some of the violence we get. I mean, sure, Chronicles of Narnia was sort of the same way, but the author of Chronicles of Narnia was a Christian, so therefore I like it on principle, and it's okay when movies like that do it, because they're not ones I disagree with. Lyra goes sneaking around and notices the college president is trying to poison a wine that's intended for James Bond. So she lunges in and smashes the glass before he can take a drink of the poison. Oh yes, clearly, James Bond needed to be saved by a teenage girl. Pfft, typical liberal Hollywood woke feminist propaganda. It turns out that James Bond is the uncle of Lyra. He shows off a video he'd managed to take of some space mineral called dust that came from space. Perm, typical space aliens coming down to our planet to try and smuggle dust into our neighborhoods. Always knew they were up to no good. No, no, apparently it actually showcases a better world without the Magisterium. Oh, what, did some atheist hippie like John Lennon write this movie or something? And even some where there is no Magisterium and no authority. That is heresy. You're absolutely right on that one, brother.
Sometimes you must do what others think best. <laughs> but I disagree, Master. <clears throat> Mrs. Coulter. Hey, wait a second. Isn't that Nicole Kidman? Well, politically, this makes me very mad. I think. I, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to tell. I, I, I don't know if mainstream conservatives still like Ann Coulter, or, or if we've just rejected her and moved on to someone else like Candace Owens. Boy howdy, it sure is hard to go a single movie review without trying to crowbar in political talking points. Anyway, Bewitched wants to take Lyra with her on a journey across the Arctic, and she gets permission rather easily. I gotta say, this movie is going by very fast. We're not even 20 minutes in, and a lot has happened so far. We then get the obligatory scene in movies meant to set up a cinematic universe, or as we used to call it, a franchise, by showing off a bunch of higher-ups in the Magisterium as potential future villains. And, hey, wait a tick! Is that Christopher Lee? They got Count Doku to be in this movie? Well, I guess it could be worse. They could have used bad AI effects to replicate Grand Moth Tarkin and Princess Leia. Before our heroes take off, Lyra is given a golden compass, just like the title suggests. And the man explains that it will answer any question you give it. An alethiometer, also known as a golden compass. Magisterium is what people need. Hmm? They keep things working by telling people what to do. Some people know what's best for them, and some people don't. Besides, they don't tell people what to do in a mean, petty way. They tell them what to do in a kindly way to keep them out of danger. And now for a Montauk of Lyra getting dressed up to look exactly like Miss Coulter, like she's one of those trashy reality housewife types of mothers who dress their children up to look just like them. And now we get this escalation. Now darling, if you take off that childish short bag, I don't like to see you wearing it indoors. Please, Mrs. Coulter. I do love it. But I do not. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, hold on. They're making the spirit animal things fight each other now? First this movie rips off the Chronicles of Narnia, then it rips off Lord of the Rings, and now we're just straight up ripping off Pokemon. Well, good job, movie. I really hope you're proud of yourself. So her ferret thing convinces her to sneak into the study of Tom Cruise's ex-wife. Here, Lyra realizes she's pulling a Maxwell and helping kidnap children for a corrupt authoritarian regime. So Lyra manages to escape and resides with a group called the Egyptians, a group that travel the world by boats. One of them she just so happens to be close friends with. Meanwhile, what is James Bond up to? Yes, yes, thank you for that. And now this witch woman shows up and tells Lyra a bunch of things I don't really care about and I'm not paying attention to. Doesn't really matter because she leaves almost as quickly as she arrives. Are you the girl the Magisterian seeks? The one with a symbol reader? Let me see you read it. I want to know if you can tell me which of the men on this ship was once my lover. Just have to say, PG-13 rating, you're still making things incredibly uncomfortable here. And now we get oh, Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott's in this too. Uh, looky here, reinforcements. Okay, so what exactly does he add to the story? Well, he operates a hot air balloon service, and he's friends with a talking polar bear named Yorick, who used to be the king of the polar bears. That is until he had lost a bet and had to give up his armor. Now he is forced to do hard day's labor in this small town alongside Sam Elliott. And because he's a defeated alcoholic, they pay him in buckets of whiskey. I feel it is appropriate to now ask the audience, does anyone else think that this stuff doesn't really connect properly? I mean, even compared to other big-budget fantasy movies like Narnia and Lord of the Rings, 
A lot of this stuff is just not making sense. I mean, I don't know about you, but it feels like this movie is just reminding me of so many other better films that I could be watching right now. Like the Star Wars prequels. Oh, and all of this doesn't really mean anything since the next scene has them getting the bear's armor back. Well, I'm glad we got that little tidbit out of the way. It's like the movie wants to be over as much as the audience does. And then we get a scene that I guess was meant to show a greater threat that Lyra and the heroes have to go up against, but like a lot of other things in this movie, it feels incredibly out of nowhere. Because this child lost his animal companion, he's now quivering in fear and sadness, but it's okay because they promised to get it back. We're safe now. Oh, we'll find your demon. We'll bring her back. I guess to give this part of the movie some tension, their camp is then attacked and Lyra is taken. Oh no, it's the kidnappers from 10,000 BC! Run for your lives! <laughs> it's funny because that's another movie I already reviewed! <laughs> I'm clever! Reference! Reference! Spoiler alert! Bazinga! Now for some reason, Lyra is not brought to Nicole Kidman, but instead she is brought to the bear that defeated Yurik. Using her wits, she convinces the bear to have a one-on-one -on -one fight for the crown against Yurik. And I will admit, this is easily the best scene in the movie, two polar bears fighting each other. So with Yurik now back as the king of the polar bears, he is now in Lyra's debt and promises to help her to travel to where the kidnapped children are. An ice bridge collapses, Lyra is captured and about to have her soul separated from her ferret thing, and then Ann Coulter shows up and saves her, dropping a bombshell on her that she is actually Lyra's mother and James Bond is her father. It's not true. Impossible. Oh man, did M. Night Shyamalan write this movie or something? Who could have possibly seen a twist like that coming? Lyra frees the children, these soldier people just show up and fight them, and then we get every character from earlier in the movie showing up to help for this third act fight scene, including the polar bear, the witch, the Egyptians, and even Sam Elliott. Cause sure, why not? We need an ending, right? And so, Lyra hops onto Sam Elliott's balloon to find James Bond. Well, that was an abrupt way to end a movie, but at least it means the movie is over now. So that was The Golden Compass, and um, yeah, I, I didn't really care for it. Now some people probably said they didn't like this movie because it had too much going on, or because it was painfully obvious the studio wanted to make yet another big money-making family fantasy franchise. But to me personally, I just have to say, I just didn't like the movie because it had atheist elements in it. I mean, are you really surprised? I mean, do you know what video series this is? It's The Captivating Christian. Of course I'm going to complain about something like that. My advice? Just stick with something like Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia. Well, until next time, everyone, may Jesus be with you. I thought Ann Coulter hated everybody. Who, Ann? No, man. She just do that to get that redneck money.